Hello, this is Scott Schwefel. I've been an insights discovery practitioner for 23 years and own a company called Discover Yourself, Insights' largest global distributor. You can reach us at discoveryourself.com and you can reach out to me anytime. My email is scott at discoveryourself.com. I'm going to take you through Insights' most recent slide deck for a two and a half to three hour virtual program. This is the virtual slide deck you would have received after participating in Insights Discovery accreditation starting in about late 2020. As you can see in this first slide, there are two variations offered for virtual programs. The first is when you've taken some of the participants through an e-learning module in advance. The second is for a group that has no previous experience with Insights Discovery and you'll be taking them through all the concepts start to finish. In nearly all of the virtual programs that I have delivered, I take the option of taking people through the program as if they have never been through it before, completely start to finish. So that is the no e-learning module variation. Here's your title slide featuring the client name or session your facilitator name, and ideally the date of the program. In preparation for a virtual or in-person program, we always recommend that you work with the client to decide the objectives and learning outcomes for the session. Think in advance about which exercises you'll be taking the group through, and in person, you'll be preparing the card deck. Personally, I do not use the physical card deck in my virtual programs. Also decide which profile questions you'll be using in the breakout rooms and how many breakout rooms you'll have. Always insert the team wheel if it's available. And if you're using breakout rooms for adapting and connecting, decide on and pre-populate the groups in advance. I rarely pre-populate the groups and nearly always bring teams together in virtual programs randomly. You may also want to identify in advance any post-session assignments or next steps. Insights Discovery, beginning the journey. Here we go. Introduce yourself here and share a bit of your background and experience. And while this slide suggests inserting your photo, I strongly encourage you to be active on video as well as encouraging all the participants to be on video actively with you. And whenever possible, using open mics if it does not create a disturbance. My preference for the technology to deliver a virtual program is strongly Zoom. 98% of the time I use that platform. I have also delivered utilizing Teams as well as WebEx and even Google Meet. But when possible, I always encourage clients to use the Zoom platform. I invite them to say hello and introduce themselves or tell me where they're from to test the audio or to type into the chat where they're physically located to make sure they've got access to it as well. After that, we're ready to start. Share with them why we're taking them through an insights discovery program. Let them know we focus on improving personal, interpersonal and team effectiveness and that discovery provides a common language about what drives our behavior in the workplace. Also, it's grounded in the work of Carl Jung. If you did speak to the client in advance and identify the objectives for today, I would add them to this slide in advance. If you didn't, this is also an opportunity to ask the team or the team leader what they hope to accomplish in the discovery program before we begin. You could offer additional information here about learning outcomes, but it may not be necessary. This is where we remind everyone that using insights discovery and learning about discovery is all about connections. Invite them to think about someone they would like to connect with more. You might even encourage them to write it down or make a note of it and let them know throughout the program you would like them to think back to this person and think about how what they are learning would apply to that specific relationship. Now we're at the heart of the discovery program. The enhanced self-awareness that comes from a deeper understanding of who am I? I would invite them to answer this question. And one of my preferred ways is to invite them to come up with an alliterative adjective and type it into the chat. I give them examples of what I might say. My name is Scott. 
I might come up with Speaking Scott or Smiling Scott or Standing Scott, and then I invite them to do the same and type their alliterative adjective with their names into the chat. I tend to read some of the answers as they come in, and when everyone has completed the exercise, I help them understand that they were consciously thinking about who they are and that one of the skills they'll need to really develop in using discovery is to become more consciously aware of who they are and how they interact with other people. Here's a good chance to remind them about the steps to personal effectiveness. Step one is explore and discover more about yourself, heightened levels of self-awareness. Step two is learning how to recognize and appreciate the differences that we perceive in others. Step three is learning how to adapt our behavior to interact more effectively with other people. And ultimately, step four is to take action and put this learning into practice. Now completed with the introductions, we are ready for the first phase of the Insights Discovery Workshop, which is an understanding of perception. And I like to share that it's how people see the world and why people see the world differently. Let everyone know that they will see the world differently from the way other people see it based on who they are. Also let them know that perceptions can change over time with awareness. Ask them about the image they see here. Ask them what they see. Ask them if they see an older woman or a younger woman. You can even invite them to tell a story about what their perception is of this older or younger woman based on what they see. Make sure everyone has an opportunity to see both variations to understand how and why some people see the world differently. Help them understand that they are in charge of their perception, both of how they come across to other people and how other people appear to be coming across to them. Now you can take the participants through a perception exercise. Share this slide and give them a moment to read it. Ask them, what are their immediate thoughts and feelings? Inviting them to either open their mics and share it with you and the team, or type their reaction, their perception of this scenario into the chat. What you're looking to do is help them understand the significant variation in the stories that people tell based on what their own perception is. Some practitioners choose to include the ladder of perception and many do not. If you choose to include it, this is how I would describe it. The ladder of perception, as you can see, is how people take in information and ultimately make a decision about what to do. If an event happens, as a camera might capture it, it's reality. But what happens is through the lens of perception, we all take in certain data. Based on our previous experience or simply who we are, some of us see things that others do not see or take notice of. Once we've done that, we begin to make value judgments. These value judgments, again, are based on who we are and our own personal histories. From those judgments, we add interpretations and give meaning to what we believe happened around us. Again, it's different based on all of our different perceptions leading us to gather different data about what happened. When we've done that, we draw a logical conclusion, which makes sense to us. As a result of the conclusions we draw, we have emotional and even physical responses to that conclusion, which leads us to form beliefs. Those beliefs we then believe to be facts about the original event. But ultimately, these beliefs may be different based on people's different perceptions. However, from the beliefs we have, we all take actions. And this is why, based on the same event, many people take different actions people know you're going to introduce them to the Insights Discovery Color Energies. Invite them to choose several of the words. I typically invite them to pick four or five words off this list that they believe describe them well. I will sometimes invite them to type those four or five words into the chat or make a note of them, write them down if they're able to do that. After I've given them time to do that, I advance the slide and allow them to see themselves through the lens of Insights Discovery Color Energies. I suggest that they look at the words they chose and begin to recognize if a pattern is developing based on color energies. 
I invite them to consider if they are seeing a pattern, look at the other words that also match the color energy they seem to have selected most and see if those words fit them as well. I suggest that this may be the beginning of understanding their leading color energy. I also might invite them to pick a few words that they strongly disagree with and again invite them to recognize that this may be their lowest color energy. I invite them to think about what might be their last and leading color energies and then introduce them to one more exercise. I invite them to read these four statements and consider which one is most like them. I remind them we're focused on the statements at this point and not the color energies. I let them know they do not necessarily need to make any notations or share anything in the chat. I just want them to consider themselves through the lens of colors. When I bring up the next set of cards, I invite them to choose which statement is most like them, but also which statement is least like them. And again, not taking any action, simply thinking about the order in which they would place these color energies. Now I share with them, I'm going to further explain the insights discovery color energy mix that's different for every one of them and the fact that there are 24 unique combinations. I'll first describe Fiery Red, which we all know to be competitive, demanding, determined, strong-willed, and purposeful. Especially in a virtual environment, I will try and use the tone of voice that helps match to the color energy that I'm describing. So when I describe Fiery Red energy, I will also speak in a Fiery Red tone. Now I take them a little deeper in understanding Red energy sharing how it shows up in these situations, but also invite them to consider for themselves when might they have demonstrated strong red energy and consider do they have a lot of fiery red energy or not so much. Earth green. I let them know that people who lead with earth green energy tend to be more caring, encouraging, sharing, patient, and relaxed. And again, to the best I can, I try and demonstrate an earth green tone and pace. Again, showing the contrast between earth green and its opposite, fiery red. Always make sure to mention the dynamic of opposites between fiery red and earth green, and of course, sunshine yellow and cool blue. Also let them know that some people's top two preferences may in fact be opposites. And in fact, Carl Jung called those creative types I let him know that I'll talk about the gifts of those creative types later as we get into the program more fully. Next, I go deeper in my conversation about earth green energy. Again, inviting them to consider when have they used or shown green energy and to consider do they have a lot of it or not so much. Next, I share with them sunshine yellow energy and the fact that yellow energy tends to show up sociable, dynamic, demonstrative, enthusiastic, and persuasive. Woohoo! I let them know if they lead with yellow energy, they like when I make sounds like that, engaged heavily in the moment. But if they don't have high yellow energy or possibly high blue energy instead, that might be an irritating sound. That usually gets a laugh. Again, here I'll take them deeper into the understanding of how yellow energy shows up and ask them to consider when have they demonstrated yellow energy themselves and do they have a lot of yellow energy or not so much. Lastly, but certainly not least, I invite them to consider cool blue energy, cautious, precise, deliberate, questioning, and formal, and consider is this possibly their leading color energy as well. I talk to them about the dynamic of how cool blue shows up with less emotion and the desire to seek as much data as possible to help make decisions. For a look at cool blue energy as well, again, sharing these different scenarios and inviting them to consider when have they demonstrated cool blue energy in their own lives. At this point, in sharing the fact that we've gone through all four of the color energies, I again remind them to consider What's the order in which they believe they demonstrate the colors? At this point, I would typically insert a slide showing the block stacked in order, but that's because in almost every opportunity we have, we ship full materials to participants even when they are working remotely. 
We feel at Discover Yourself, it's very valuable that people have the actual physical tools, even if working remotely. And as that's typically the case, this is where I would invite them to hold up their blocks in the order that they believe they show the color energies. I would stop sharing my slides so they can all see each other, and I would encourage them to open their mics and talk to each other as they identify people who are similar to their style, and even to call out and look for people who may lead with their opposite energy. It's a great exercise and very engaging, allowing the participants to begin to see each other through the lens of colors. Occasionally, we will not have the opportunity to ship physical materials to participants, and if they are simply working from a PDF copy of the profile and virtual materials, instead of stacking the blocks, we would invite them to type the order of their color energies into the chat. Again, looking to see whose color orders might be the same as theirs, and also looking for people, teammates, who might be different from them. I'll again share with them the overview of the Insights Discovery color energies, reminding them of the dynamic of opposites, red and green being opposites, blue and yellow being opposites, and also the reminder that some people, about 9% of our profiles, demonstrate people who do lead with those two opposite color energies. As they've claimed their leading color energy, I'll invite them to consider it again, and now I'll share with them the risk of overusing the gift of their leading color energies. As they've identified their leading color energy, I now share with them what they may appear like when they overuse the gift of that color energy, but also when they may be using it in a natural amount, but it is perceived by their opposite type as showing up on a bad day. I'll walk them through four styles and then move them into the understanding that no one is labeled as just one color ever that we are all a combination of all four color energies, and that at times we rely on the energy we lead with, often what's second, sometimes what's third, and rarely, but sometimes, we're able to demonstrate our lowest color energy. I remind them that the combination of the four color energies is what creates the uniqueness of who they are. Now it's time to talk about the Jungian preferences. I remind participants that Carl Jung wrote Psychological Types in 1921 and that our work, the entire Insights Discovery System, is based on his work. We share this quote from Carl Jung, every advance, every conceptual achievement of mankind has been connected with an advance in self-awareness. I remind them that Insights Discovery is all about helping them enhance their own levels of self-awareness to create better connections with other people. Now, there's two ways to work with this next slide. One is to bring up all the choices and invite participants to consider which one is more or less like them. Another way is to bring the slide up completely like this and invite participants to turn on annotation and add their initials or their own mark or check mark along the lines of where they see themselves. It creates more engagement and if you're comfortable with the technology, it's an interesting way to help teams understand themselves and each other through the lens of introversion and extroversion. If you're simply allowing them to make a choice where they fall based on all of these options, ultimately I would invite them to type into the chat whether they believe they are more introverted or more extroverted. Next, in a similar fashion, invite them to consider Jung's decision-making functions, thinking and feeling. Invite them to look at the words and consider where they fall in the spectrum between the two extremes and either have them decide and type the answer, thinking versus feeling, into the chat, or as we said earlier with Jung's attitudes, invite them to consider on the spectrum where they might annotate their initials or a mark or check mark, and again, engage the group in that way if you're comfortable with the technology. You're now able to show them how we layer Jung's attitudes and decision-making functions around the Insights Discovery Wheel. Remind them of the four colors and the descriptors, fiery red, sunshine yellow, earth green, and cool blue. Share with them that red and yellow energy are more extroverted, and cool blue and earth green are more introverted, also 
that cool blue and fiery red on the top of the wheel are thinking-based, logic-based decision makers. And people who lead with more green and yellow energy tend to be feeling-based, people-based, relationship-based decision makers. You can take the learning deeper if you'd like to use these animations, reminding them about blue and green being more introverted and red and yellow being more extroverted. Again, reminding them blue and red energy at the top of the model are thinking-based decision makers and green and yellow energy at the bottom are feeling-based decision makers. You can share with them that the reason we define the color energies the way we do is because of the Jungian attitudinal functions that sit underneath them. Remind them that fiery red is Jung's extroverted thinkers. Sunshine yellow is extroverted feelers. Earth green is introverted feelers. And those who lead with cool blue are Jung's introverted thinkers. Now let me say a couple things before I move into this next slide and into the entire concept of Jung's perceiving functions, sensation, and intuition. I will rarely bring sensation and intuition into a primary two and a half or even three hour virtual workshop. There are, however, some practitioners who do. If you do choose to bring sensation and intuition into your day one virtual program, you'll use this slide as well and the next three also. If you choose to, you'll simply invite people when they see the next slide to write down what is there for you. Make sure to ask in advance that they are prepared with a pen and a pad to be able to write something down. Again, I typically would not include this portion of sensation and intuition and the next few examples in a day one virtual program. I don't believe that you are losing any of the impact of a day one program. And again, if you're comfortable with the content and choose to do so, it also works very well. In addition to queuing up this slide by the previous slide, you may also simply delete the previous slide. And when this slide comes up, I like to say, write about this slide. I have found that that question delivers some of the best results. Again, simply asking them to write about this slide. It's very important to queue it up that way so that you don't skew people towards sensation or intuition unintentionally. Allowing them time to write down what their thoughts are allows them a chance to identify individually if they potentially lead more with sensation or more with intuition, which will define for them based on what they wrote in just a moment. In explaining sensation again and intuition, we help them understand that that which is brought into us through our five senses, in this case, seeing what's on the slide, leads people to write down exactly what's there. Horse, sun, grass, orange sky. Intuition is quite different. Intuition is information that comes to us, not through our five senses. Some people call it a sixth sense. And again, remember Jung brought it up and wrote about it in 1921. Those with strong intuition tend to write things that aren't actually on the slide, but information which has come to them, such as friendship, open space, freedom, companionship, peace, love, joy. Many times, they'll even tell a story or make up a story. In fact, people with strong intuition often will not even have the word horses in the description that they wrote down of the slide. Help them understand the differences are essentially how people take in information. And again, to be able to go a little bit deeper, we offer one more slide on this topic. I misspoke, it's two more slides. This is simply a recap of that spectrum again, potentially inviting them now with deeper information to consider where do they fall between sensation and intuition. And in this final slide, it's where we share the understanding that within each of the four color energies, both sensation and intuition exist. And again, most practitioners do not include this information in a day one virtual program, but if you've chosen to do so, help them see how fiery red can be divided by those who lead with fiery red and gather information through their senses and share with them that means driven to achieve, completing tasks with an organized hands-on approach, 
and that people who lead with fiery red and gather information through intuition, in this case, challenge authority by seeking to break free from convention. Move through the slide as you share these combinations, again, inviting the participants to consider, based on their leading energy, which side do they see themselves on sensation versus intuition. Again, one final comment. If you as a practitioner are comfortable with these previous five or six slides focused on sensing and intuition, I invite you to use them. If you're just getting started and want to begin to deliver the workshop, you might learn through the absence of this section. And at some point when you feel more comfortable, add it back when you're ready. Here's a final summary of all eight types, leading with four color energies, again, divided by those who use sensation versus use intuition. Now in the final summary of Jung's psychological preferences, share how we are oriented towards our environment, introversion versus extroversion, share how people gather information secondly, if in fact you've chosen to include sensation and intuition so that you are sharing these in the order in which we use them, and finally share how we make decisions based on information that we've gathered, thinking based on data, facts, and logic, or feelings based on people, feelings, and relationships. If you, like most practitioners, have chosen not to include sensation and intuition in your virtual program, delete that section from this slide and simply summarize introversion, extroversion, thinking, and feeling. Now let's move into the actual profile itself. If you've shipped actual physical materials, invite them to open up their physical printed and bound profiles. And if you're working with groups that only have a PDF access, allow them to have access to it on their screens to be ready to work with it. Now, just like we do in an in-person session, we're inviting the participants to review the overview section. It's to find out their level of personal validity and how well they connect with their own profile. If they have a physical printed profile, use this slide and invite them to put a star or stars next to statements that are particularly accurate and resonate with them. Also put a question mark or underline any statements which they might disagree with. Again, this is if they have a printed profile. If you're working with a group that only has PDFs, I would invite them and modify this slide to say, make a note of any statements you believe are accurate and make a note of any statements that you might disagree with and give them time to do that. Now, as they've just completed validating the profile and identifying key statements, both that they identify with and that they disagree with, before I dive into sharing this, I invite them into breakout rooms, randomly put together in groups of three or four, to share what they starred and also in talking with teammates who know them well, share what they underlined or question marked in disagreement and invite teammates to give them feedback on those statements. This is always the first breakout that I like to include in my virtual programs. I will often enter into some of those breakout rooms to check in on the conversation, make sure they are engaged well with each other, giving them plenty of time so that everyone has a chance to share those key statements. What I would then invite them to do, and again, not every practitioner needs to do this, but I have them take the key statement they identified and starred, and I invite them to type it into the chat. If they have an electronic copy of the profile, they will often simply highlight, cut, and paste it into the chat. And this is where I invite them to learn that we will be collecting some key information in the chat and sending it back out in one document that they will all have access to. The first thing that we share in that document that we're building is the key statement that describes them so well. Again, it's not a necessary breakout, but I find it a very effective way to begin the conversation. If you choose not to do it, you'll move right into this slide. If you choose to do it, give them time to complete it, type those key statements into the chat, and then move them here to the evaluator frames and how we created their graphs. At the same time, I would start again here. I would invite everyone to go to the last page in their profile so they've got their bar graphs right in front of them. Now on this slide, I would invite them to understand that we really asked just one question 25 times in a row. 
And the question was how much yellow, green, red, and blue energy do you have? Again, same question 25 times in a row. I would share with them that even though there's a least and a most, the scale is still linear. So that least represents zero and most represents six. We've taken their 25 answers and put together the average to produce for them the graph on the left. This graph on the left is their conscious persona. This graph on the left is who they are when they're thinking about who they are. If you move through the slide, it will remind you of these key concepts as well. Make sure that you advance the slides that have animation to make sure that you are able to speak to all the content that's ultimately included. I like to share with people that when they wake up in the mirror, sorry, wake up and look in the mirror on a work day, they tend to begin to think about who they are, who they need to be, and how they think other people expect them to be. That's a good definition of the left-hand graph. I also move into a conversation about the fact that it's a portrait picture of you, a selfie as an example, where you're thinking about how you're showing up. Then I share with them the less conscious graph. It's more of a candid photograph. Someone took it of you when you were unaware of your own behavior. A key component to this graphs page that I like to share is that brain science estimates we are only consciously aware three to five percent of the time. Meaning we operate as the right hand less conscious graph operating out of a mindset that's not aware of how we're showing up potentially 95% of the time. It really speaks to the value that insights discovery can bring in helping us be more self-aware. Invite people to consider the fact that they wake up every day as the graph on the right and if it's a work day they tend to begin to think about who they believe they need to be and they mentally jump to the left hand graph. As they make that jump, they jump through the preference flow. I let people know the preference flow is a very valuable part of the insights discovery model. It's because the preference flow helps us understand what is it that we do to ourselves and do with ourselves when we move to conscious awareness. I always use this slide as my example to discuss preference flow before I invite them to look at theirs. In inviting them to consider their own preference flow, I share with them first the fact that this is an individual who, when they're unaware of their behavior, leads with high red followed by yellow energy. And in the moment they move to consciousness, typically it could be the morning of a work day, this person says, I'm going to push up my blue energy. In effect saying, I'm going to go to work and try to be more analytical, more cautious, more deliberate, and more precise. I'm even going to bring a little more yellow energy and I believe I've got enough green and red energy. In fact, I might not even bring exactly as much green energy as I naturally have. But as they begin to put themselves in that new position, it creates the conscious graph. That pushing up of blue energy raises it from 8% to 28%. And as a result, they might believe because of their effort that more teammates will see their high blue energy. But again, even when they put in the effort, it still only gets up to 28%. And if they work with people at 60, 70, or 80% blue energy, they might be seen as still having lower blue energy. I often bring up the concept that most people in a group, and I often ask them to raise their hands or type the answer in the chat, I ask them if their highest color energy in the preference flow is also their lowest color on the right. And what that speaks to for many people is this idea that they've learned to compensate for their lowest preference by pushing it up every day. I suggest that that may not be the best answer because pushing up your blue energy may not be the best thing to do all the time. If we become more aware of our movement back and forth between conscious and less conscious and more aware of what we're actually pushing up or possibly down in the preference flow, it's one of the key ways that I believe people can help learn to be better communicators in the moment. Increasing one energy based on recognizing that color energy and the person they are communicating with. The last thing I'll share is the preference flow percentage underneath the middle graph. You can see in this example, it's 12.8%. I remind people the scale is not zero to 100%, which they almost always assume. I share with them that the scale is from negative 66.7% all the way up to 66.7% positive. And also that in a bell curve, most people come in around 35%.
I always stress there's no good or bad preference flow percentage. But what it does indicate is the intensity with which we feel these changes to our natural color energies. What I remind people of is that while some people may experience tension, stress, and anxiety on a Sunday afternoon when they think about work, there's a number of people who experience thrill and excitement at the same time. Our perception determines how we feel. But I always invite people to consider if when they think about becoming who they need to be for the work that they do, and it's an unpleasant sensation of any kind, they should really begin to question what about their preference flow is prompting them to feel that way. And is that preference flow pattern necessarily the best for them? This is where I will invite people into a second breakout. Our second breakout is for people to dive in and share their graphs with each other, share their preference flows, and share their story. If they have a printed copy, I invite them to hold their graphs up to their camera. If they have a PDF copy, I always have Zoom set so they can share their screens with each other. Here you see the Insight standard slides also include a slide indicating that second breakout room activity, the sharing of the profiles with each other. Again, this is one where I would always try and get into as many break rooms as I can as the facilitator, because there are always questions in each of the rooms as we go in. I remind everyone before I put them again randomly, and this is new randomly created groups. I always recreate the groups between each breakout activity but always remind them that they've got the opportunity to call you as a facilitator into the rooms if they have a question. I always allow for eight or 10 minutes. And again, I'll always check in with some of the groups to make sure they have had enough time to have rich conversations, as I think it's one of the most important parts of the Discovery Workshop. Now, as people are coming back from what would be my second breakout, it might be your first. I drop my slides and stop sharing so they can all see each other and I'll ask as they come back if anyone has any additional questions about the graphs. I'll prompt them for comments about the conversations they had. But again, most importantly, the goal is to make sure that everyone clearly understands less conscious and conscious graphs and the preference flow and what it means to them, as well as the preference flow percentage. If I believe everybody has that rich understanding, I invite them then to look at the page just in front of the bar graphs and let them know we're now going to look at the Insights Discovery 72 type wheel. By the way, just a comment, if we've sent physical materials to the participants, the one thing we do not send in advance is their team wheel. We have found that the anticipation of teams being able to see the team wheel delivers a much better result than allowing them see it in advance. So in sharing the Insights Discovery, Insights Discovery 72 type wheel, what are some of the key things that we share? We talk about the fact that there's only two things that determine your wheel position. One is the order of your colors. And secondly, is the number of color energies above or below the midline. Before moving directly into the focused types, I would also share with participants that some of them have what appears to be two dots a faded dot representing the right-hand graph, and then a brighter dot representing the left-hand graph. While others may have what appears to be just one bright dot, but it actually is the less conscious and the conscious dots on top of each other. Share with them that because the two things that defined where wheel positions fall are the order of the colors and the number of colors above and below the midline, that those participants whose color order is the same in both graphs and who have two colors above and two colors below the midline in both graphs will show what appears to be the one wheel position. Remind people that have two dots that it's the bright dot that is their wheel position. With that knowledge, share with them that if they fall into the outermost ring, and again, it's the brightest dot here, they fall into the focus type. It only happens 3% of the time, and what it represents, as you can see in the graph example, is someone who has one color energy above the midline and three colors below. If you move to the classic type, remember to share with them that this is where most people fall, which is relying comfortably on their top two colors above the midline while having two color energies below the midline. It happens here 
in the middle ring and 54% of the time. If someone falls into what we call the accommodating type, it means they have three color energies above the midline and fall in the innermost ring. It happens 43% of the time. Remind people that people who fall in the accommodating ring may have more access to more color energies because they have three above the midline and as a result might have more opportunity to make connections with other people with other color energies but that anybody who chooses to pull up color energies for the benefit of other people can always become the best communicators. Next is to remind people about the gray spokes and the fact that they represent people whose top two color energies are opposites. The reason the spokes are gray is they represent people's ability who fall in the creative position to jump back and forth across the wheel, demonstrating stronger versatility and demonstrating not only their top two leading color energies, but all four color energies as a result of their less conscious combination as well. Again, remind people there are unique gifts to the creative types as sometimes people may feel called out in that position as there's only one or two in most of the groups you will be working with. I would also always walk around the eight types of the wheel and give an explanation of those labels. If they have the tools such as the reference guide, invite them into the pages of the reference guide that explain the eight types. And if they're working with simply the PDF version, again, also share with them the meaning of the eight types can be found there. I like to talk about the eight types as ways in which participants will be showing up. I typically start with myself as an inspirer letting them know that that's what I like to do, inspire others to greater things. As I move around the wheel, I remind them that helpers love to help others, that supporters are like helpers, but tend to be okay in a more introverted position, supporting others at times from a distance and without others' awareness. Coordinators bring the gift of organizational skills. Observers like to take in the data and solve problems, Reformers like to assess a situation and take action. Directors love to direct events and the actions of others. I remind people it is not meant to be a job title. And motivators love to motivate people to take action. If you've chosen to bring sensing and intuition into your program, it's okay to mention motivators lead strongly with extroverted intuition and coordinators lead strongly with introverted sensation and that reformer and helper are each combinations but again, if you're choosing not to use sensing and intuition, simply the definition of what the eight type labels mean is enough. Here we get people thinking about their unique wheel position and about their relationship with others who are close to them in the wheel and their relationship and their communication with people who may be in fact their opposite types. I will always insert the team wheel when I have it, remembering that as we never send it out in advance, this will be the first time that anyone has seen it. There's always a high level of interest and engagement on this slide. Show them the team wheel and ask them what it means to them. Ask them what they notice about the collective group, maybe the company or organizational culture. Invite them to look at who's like them on the team, who's very different from them on the team as well. If you're using a team wheel which also shows the pie charts, Remind them that the left-hand pie chart is everyone's leading color energies and how they're distributed, and that the pie chart on the right is everyone's color energies in preferred or inclined usage, meaning all the color energies of everyone in the group or team above the midline. I always allow the team's time to look at the listing of all the participants and explain that over on the right is the listing and order of everyone's color energies and that the blue line between the circles or colored circles representing the individual's color energies represents the midline. Left of that blue slash is above the midline preferred usage. Right of that blue slash is reluctant usage. Okay, here in the workshop, I might pause and remind participants of what we've been through so far. The fact that we've discussed perception and how people see the world differently, the good day, bad day, color energies and creative types, and Jung's preferences. Then we dove into the profiles and shared conversations there. 
there's always additional conversations that could be had if time allows. One that I often insert is the conversation about communications preferences. It will often be the third breakout that, that my groups engage in, and it's simply going to pages 10 and 11, effective communications, and highlighting the one most important to each of them. What's the communications do, and what's the communications don't? Once they've identified them, I'll randomly put them into breakout rooms of three or four people, inviting them to share with teammates what they want teammates to understand that they would do in communicating with that person and what they would try not to do in communicating with that person. I'd give them again about 10 minutes. And then when inviting them back, I would also create the opportunity for them to type into the chat their communications preferences highlighted by starting with the words do and don't. Again, it's part of the worksheet that we will compile and send back out to all the participants. It also makes for excellent conversation and a very good third breakout in the way that I deliver those workshops. It's helpful to add a slide to remind you to do that, but you certainly don't need a slide and can insert it anywhere it seems to make sense. That being said, now we would move to recognizing types. What I always share with participants here is that everything we've done up until this point has been focused on them and their levels of self-awareness. And in fact, the profile has been the key component for all of that. What I share with them now is that either the reference guide, physical reference guide, or the virtual reference guide are tools that we now move to to begin to look beyond ourself and our own graphs and wheel position to understanding how to identify the uniqueness of others. We share with people that they've got constant opportunity to recognize type in other people. Not just people that they work with, but personal relationships and even people they don't know. People we pass in the hall or people we might share a ride with in an elevator. What we want to do is become more consciously aware of our ability to put people into the four color energies. Again, thinking about them in terms of introversion, extroversion, thinkers and feelers looking for high or low levels of emotion, high or low levels of engagement, and high or low levels of interest in detail as examples. Think about every time you meet someone attempting to understand where they fall in the insights discovery model. Here's some ways people might consider doing it. Consider for fiery red and sunshine yellow, is it someone who speaks to think? While they're thinking, they're always speaking out loud and putting their ideas out in front of everyone. Or someone with more blue and earth green energy might be very quiet as they're thinking and they completely think out what they're going to say before they say it so that it is very complete when they do. Obviously, you can see in the graphic, blue and green energy tend to be more quiet. Red and yellow energy tend to be more loud, more talkative. The second step again is identifying more formal or informal based on people being more of a thinker on the top of the model and a feeler on the bottom. I believe people with green and yellow energy tend to show more emotion and people with blue and red energy tend to show less emotion. Again, in the combination of extroversion coupled with feeling based decisions or sunshine yellow, they tend to show the most emotion and cool blue Introverted thinking tends to show the least emotion. Fiery red, leading with extroverted thinking, tends to always be engaged in activity, getting things done. And the opposite, earth green, introverted feeling, tends to be all about supporting, taking care of, and paying attention to other people. Give people the opportunity to go back to the single individual they identified early on in our program that they wanted to make a better connection with and invite them to think about where would they put that person in the model. Invite them to consider a spouse or a partner or people they manage or maybe their own manager. Where do they see others in the discovery model? One of the opportunities that we have every day and even 50 to 100 times a day is to send better emails thinking about people's unique communications preferences. The simplest way is to look at the emails you receive from someone and send back something similar. What are the clues we're looking for? Here's an example of an email you might receive. What do you notice about it right away? Not a lot of detail, lots of exclamation points, 
post this slide up and ask your participants to open their microphones and share with you what they see or invite them to type it into the chat. After you've allowed them to engage with it a little bit, remind them that it demonstrates a preference for sunshine yellow energy. When you've done that, remind them if they receive an email like this, they need to write an email back. How about this email as an example? Again, invite the participants to tell you what they see or type into the chat what they see. Lots of detail, no greeting, no emotion suggests a preference for cool blue energy. Continue through the examples. Remind them, again, after receiving their input to what they perceive this to be, that an email with um, a tone that seems calm and kind and connected and caring and very relational is likely going to be someone who leads with Earth Green. Write back an email that's calm and caring and relational. And also remind them that not everybody wants to receive an email that might be written specifically for fiery red. In fact, in this example, you can see that the first email is immediately followed by a second. Forget it. Figured it out myself. Let them know this could be a preference for red energy. The whole idea is on a daily basis, pay attention to emails you receive. Think about them in light of the color energies and write back a better email for the benefit of others. Ask your group if they believe you can pick up on personality styles with just a short text message and share with them some of these examples. Again, looking to recognize type in as many ways and as often as we can during the workday and with our personal relationships as well. Share this example and ask them what clues they see to indicate color energy. Recognize that the clues lead to sunshine yellow energy and there's also a follow-up slide to help make sure people can see it. This enlarged version allows people to call out some of the clues they see to help identify yellow energy. The emoticons, the exclamation points, and the energy and enthusiasm that comes through even in a text message. Share with them another example, and again, magnify it to help them understand what are the real clues they see that help them identify red energy. This is a great opportunity for them to do the speaking and for you to simply continue to ask, what else do you see? What else do you see? Let the team really understand they're already good at recognizing type. It's all about being able to practice more. Here's another example. Examples here like needing to research the cost of using all the platforms is a good indicator of cool blue energy. Again, invite them here to identify additional clues they see that allow them to recognize a text message as being cool. And lastly, all about caring, connection, and relationship, Earth Green. Again, call on the group to share with each other what they recognize as clues and indicators of Earth Green energy. Now let them know we're on the last section of the Insights Discovery Program. Hopefully you've always been pausing and continuing to ask for questions and comments throughout, but this is another great example to ask for comments and questions. In fact, if no one in the group virtually is offering up comments or questions, I will sometimes let them know I need a question or two to move on and again, continue the engagement. It is helpful to drop the slides when asking for questions and comments to allow people to see each other and continue to make connections even though they're virtual. Again, if you're using physical materials, remind people that the Foundation's reference guide is filled with great information about it, adapting and connecting as well as recognizing type. And again, if you're working just with a PDF, remind them to look at the virtual Foundation's reference guide that we will include every time we use PDFs only. Remind them that adapting and connecting to Cool Blue is to be prepared and thorough and not be flippant. Walk them around the examples, each time pausing to ask them, based on their leading color energy, what else? What else would they like teammates to know about adapting and connecting with them? It's another great opportunity to have a conversation where you're pulling information from the participants to help them see the color energies in themselves and also comfortably share with teammates how they would like to be communicated with.
While I've used many variations of this exercise in my in-person workshops, I have found it quite difficult to pull off this type of exercise in a virtual environment. It's because it's difficult to allow people to choose a room together to move into a breakout, to have this conversation. And it's also just as difficult to predetermine rooms to put partners in so that they are in fact connected with partners who lead with different color energies. What I might consider is a random breakout room with three or four people or four people to five so that there's the potential for partners in those groups to just simply talk, identify opposite or different color energies and have conversations. I haven't done that, but I think that would be a good way to consider bringing this exercise into a virtual environment. This is a suggested scenario to go along with that exercise. So while people have been placed in a breakout room and are talking to seek out people with different or opposite color energies, you could broadcast this message to each of the breakout rooms using either your voice or the message broadcast function to give them some scenarios to work through in the breakout. Again, taking time to enter into some of the breakout rooms to make sure the facilitation is covered and the breakout rooms and the conversations are working well. In bringing people back after that final breakout, if you chose to include it, or in simply stopping to share your PowerPoint, to invite them to share their personal feedback on how the program went for them and what actions they will take. To me, that's an excellent way to close out the session. You could also create one final breakout if you chose not to do the previous scenario and in the breakout rooms, have them commit to teammates in groups of three or four what they will do to put discovery into place. Remind them when they come back from that breakout, if you choose to do it, that personal development is that we are what we repeatedly do and that excellence is not an act, but it's a habit for continual practice and participation. Remind them that the journey continues beyond the discovery workshop and invite them to think about what do they discover about themselves? Also, what do they appreciate about the styles of others? Recognizing those with styles like theirs and their opposite types as well. Ask them to again commit to how they will adapt their behavior. Even to enter something into the chat is another possibility. And remind them about what's the key action they'll take to be able to keep discovery alive. There's always additional resources. Discovery Insightful Strategies Job Aid, allowing them to support the remembering of characteristics, communication tips, and the preferences of all the color energies. We always use the full reference guide um, when we're able to send that out physically or the mini reference guide, uh, which can be shared electronically. As you see here, the suggestion is a color block image. The idea here is that these are virtual support resources Again, I strongly encourage you as a practitioner to bring in at a minimum blocks and reference guides or blocks and some physical job aid to help people implement the insights discovery model to receive the greatest impact over time. Thanks very much for joining me. I was hoping to keep this under one hour and we did again. My expectation is this content will take you two and a half to three hours to deliver in a virtual environment. And again, my name is Scott Schwefel. My contact information is scott at discoveryourself.com. Reach out to me with any additional questions you might have. Feel free to call me also with your questions. My number is 952-454-4065. If you'd like to reach out through our company, Discover Yourself, our website is discoveryourself.com. And I hope that you can put these and implement these practices in place to deliver exceptional and, and valuable workshops virtually and also in person for all the groups and teams and leaders that you're able to work with. Thanks again. Again, here's my contact information. I'm Central Time Zone in North America. And if I can help you out in any way, please reach out. Thanks again for joining me for the last hour. I hope you found it helpful.